Praise the Lord. It's good to see you all. Welcome all the parents who are visiting, and good to see you all. If you are by any chance freshmen and newcomers, we welcome you as well. So good to see you all. Probably we only have half of our people back. Next week, I'm sure we'll have everybody back. But uh, it's good to be here. Just coming back from Houston uh, this morning, finishing a young adult retreat in Houston uh, till yesterday, and then came back this morning. So I'm a little out of it, but I'm sure I'll be in it as we look into the Word of God. Let's look into the look into Luke chapter 19, verse 1 through 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay him back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. Let's pray. Father, we just praise you and thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you that you are here in this place. We thank you for all the people that are safe and back. We thank you that for all the people who are excited about New Student Outreach. We thank you also for all the transfer students as well as newcomers. We thank you for all the parents. Our sincere desire is that as we gather together, may we see the heart of God, heart of Christ, who came to this world to seek and to save the lost. We pray that as we look into the scripture, may we have that kind of mindset and heart and attitude of a shepherd that, are, that is seeking for a one lost sheep. And we pray that we'll have that kind of attitude and hearts. We pray that you're, you will convict our hearts today as you speak to our hearts through your scripture. We ask you for your blessings. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. There was this artist who wanted to picture, with his uh, artistic ability, picture uh, picture of evangelism. How is evangelism uh, can be pictured? How can evangelism be pictured with one picture uh, that he can draw? He thought about it and thought about it, and he finally thought about some good idea, and he uh, drew sort of a shipwreck and ship that is broken so that people are all over the place trying to survive in this storm. And in the storm, in the midst of a storm, in the middle, if you look carefully, you can see that everybody's in agony, everybody's in danger, except right in the middle of a picture, there was this rock risen above the water level. And in the, uh, in between the, in bis- right beside the rock, there was a man who was holding on to uh, this rock in the midst of a storm while everybody's uh, about to die. And we see that, of course, storm is a situation of life and the circumstance of this world where uh, it pictures the lostness of the people. And of course, that rock is a uh, rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ and the gospel. And as you look into that, you know, it just seems like it summarizes the picture of evangelism very well. But as he thought about it and thought about it, he was not satisfied with the picture. So he erased all the picture, he ripped it apart, and he drew another picture instead. So everything is the same except right in the middle of a picture there was a rock, and this man, instead of holding onto the rock tightly with two hands, he's holding onto the rock with one hand, and with the other hand he's reaching out to save one of his friends so that he, in the midst of a storm he can find a life through that rock. I think that summarizes what living in this world is like, in this 
world where there is so much storm and the winds of life that tries to capture and swallow people, we need to be the people that are holding on to the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ. And we need to extend our arm to others who may be dying without Christ. And of course, this week is a good week to practice that for those people who are here because we, that's exactly what we are doing in this New Student Outreach Week. There might be many people in this week that are trying to find something, trying to find uh, niche, friendships. And we need to be those people who are extending our arms to them. So I thought this was a good message to talk about on the New Student Outreach Week. So let's talk about it. As we think about this text, we'll think about two things. First of all, we'll th think about Zacchaeus, who's a sinner, who's, who's a lost person in this text. And then we'll think about Jesus, who's witnessing, who's extending his arm to the lost one, Zacchaeus. So that we, in turn, may be like Christ this week, who are extending uh, our arms uh, to the lost people. First of all, let's talk about Zacchaeus, so that we can compare Zacchaeus to the condition of the lostness of humanity. As we look into this text, it says, Jesus, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. In verse 1 and verse 2, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. So first thing that we have to realize about this, uh, this tax collector named Zacchaeus is that he had some kind of status because he was a chief tax collector. Of course, Israel at that time was captured by Roman government and tax collectors were working for the Roman government. And when you say he was a chief tax collector, not just a tax collector, but a chief tax collector, he had some kind of status. Of course, when we think about the lostness of humanity, lost people in this world, they have some kind of status and they have something they can cling on to. And perhaps because of that, they do not, they do not know the need that they need gospel of Jesus Christ. Of course, in this text, Zacchaeus has some kind of status, something that he can be prideful about. Also, another characteristic of this man named Zacchaeus is that not only he had status, but also he, has, he had money, material position. He was a wealthy person. As you look into verse 2, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief collector, chief tax collector, and he says he was wealthy. Sometimes things that we have could be deceiving because we think, we could easily think that we have something more than we actually have. Even though we don't have much, we may think that we have some kind of wealthy and happiness and all these things because it gives at least a temporary pleasure in this world. As we think about Zacchaeus, he had money, he was wealthy, he had material possession. Third thing about that we, we have to understand about this man named Zacchaeus is not only he had a status, but not only he had money, but also he was a sinner. He had sin. He was a tax collector. Now, if you understand about tax collector at the time, was that tax collectors worked for the Roman government. And as they worked for the Roman government, they had to get a lot of taxes and they had to give a certain amount to the Roman government. And they were keeping some money to themselves. So there's a double, uh, two things that are wrong when other Jews were looking at these tax collectors. Because first of all, you are considered as a traitor because you are working for a government that is uh, ruling over your country. Another thing is that because most of the tax collectors collected more money than they ought to and kept it to themselves, they were considered as sinners and thieves. So he was a traitor and a sinner. Not only uh, uh, by the virtue of the name that he was a sinner, but also everybody else seems to agree. As we look into verse 7, it says, All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Meaning, when Jesus has gone to be with Zacchaeus later on, people are saying, he has gone to uh, the guest of a sinner. He, he, had, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Meaning, everybody else seems to agree that he is a sinner. Not only that, he himself knows that he is a sinner. As we look into verse 8, Zacchaeus, he says, stood up when Jesus forgives him and Jesus gives him the gospel. He is responsive to the gospel. And verse 8, he says, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to a poor. Why would he do that? Unless he knows he's guilty. Half of my possessions to, to a poor. If I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay him back four times the amount. Why would he be willing to do that unless he knows that there's something in his mind that he's guilty of? You know, there are, there are people in the world who are doing whatever they want and living a lifestyle while living, but as we search into their lives, 
Everybody has what we call conscience, God-given law written in their hearts. And they know somehow they have some kind of fear for God, some kind of fear for higher being, because everybody has what is called conscience. And they know that there's something wrong with their lives. And as we know in, in this text, the Zacchaeus was not an exception either. He knew he was a sinner. The fourth thing about this Zacchaeus is that he has some kind of emptiness. There was a hole in his heart that he cannot fill with his wealth, with his status, and with everything that he had. There was still a hole, an emptiness in his heart. When we look into verse 3, why would this man who does not lack any, any material possession, who has a status in the, in the world, he is pretty much set and he's pretty much stable. As you look into verse 3, it says he wanted to see Jesus. Why in the world would this kind of man who does not lack much, who is not sick physically, would want to see Jesus? Because he has some kind of emptiness in his heart. Just like there's famous saying that everybody has a hole in their hearts, and that hole is cross-shaped. Unless they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, knowing that they have, their sins were forgiven by some higher being, some kind of sinless being, they will always feel that emptiness. They, they, even though they will try to fill that emptiness with money, status, and anything, all that, all that they are and all that they have, they will not fill that hole because it is cross-shaped. It will always have, have that void and emptiness in their hearts. And of course, the Zacchaeus was not an exception. Now, people in the world, no matter what kind of things that they do, and although it gives temporary pleasure, it is vanished very quickly. And what happens is that they will feel that emptiness and void. They might be in the midst of 100 people, but they still feel alone and lonely and empty. You know, this past week, I went to a retreat in Houston, and I was preaching to the young adults, congregation of young adults. And uh, most of them, I, when I told them that I, have, I gained... I get $800 from a church a month, $800 a month from a church. They were so shocked, especially this one of the U of I graduates who was there. And he, grad, he was like a freshman uh, when I was a uh, fifth-year senior, something like that. And uh, uh, he was so shocked because he told me that he was complaining about his salary. So I said, how much do you get a year? He, he was an engineer. He said he gets $40,000 a year. <laughs> so I told him, do you have any conscience after this now? You know, knowing that how much I get, I'm getting less than 10000 a year. And uh, somehow I'm surprised. He goes, no. As I talk to these guys who are getting thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year with status and position, every one of them that I talked to said they feel empty because they didn't have a right relationship with God. Zacchaeus was not an exception. He had emptiness in his heart, a void that could, he could not fill with status or the money. And the things that the world could give, he had emptiness. So is everybody that are living out there without Jesus Christ. Unless we are convicted by that, unless we believe that, we cannot share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody is in need. And we have the answer to fill that void. We have the answer that are cross-shaped in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gospel is the most powerful message because nothing can fill that hole, only the gospel most powerful message in this world unless we have that kind of pride knowing that answer in Jesus Christ knowing that answer knowing that it is the only message that can fill their hearts we will not be able to go to them with conviction fifth thing about this Zacchaeus not only was did he have status money he was a sinner and empty but also he heard of Jesus before when we think about uh, Zacchaeus, he heard of Jesus before. Because when we look into verse 3, it says, he wanted to see who Jesus was. Meaning, before this occasion, he comes to uh, climb the sycamore tree, somehow he heard of Jesus somewhere. That's why he comes at this moment. Why is that important? Because on, it is very, very rare for someone to come to uh, find out about Jesus unless he heard of Jesus before, unless they had some apologetic arguments, unless he heard some testimony of somebody. Meaning, what you do this week is very important because there might be some people who never heard of Jesus, and you talk about Jesus, you're a Christian, who's Christian? Who's a fundamental Christian? Are you from Waco, Texas or something like that? I, in fact, I, this past week I met uh, some people from Waco, Texas, because I went to Texas, Houston, and met some people. A lot of, for a lot of people, 
who are coming from different places who never heard of gospel, they are thinking of either uh, those famous preachers who fell into sin, or they are thinking about places like Waco, Texas or something like that. They just don't know about Christianity, what Christianity is about. A lot of people have negative concept about Christianity. You know why? Because they have they had pre-evangelism concerning negative things about Christianity. Through either television or through many kind of things through their friends, they heard about negative information concerning Christianity. That's why you go to them and talk about gospel, they have negative response. Why as Christians, can we go out to them and share some positive things about Christianity? Yeah, I'm a person that wants to die for Jesus Christ. I have other conviction that Jesus is the answer. We need to change this negative concept that are fitting, uh, fitted in their minds. We need to go to them and plan in their minds positive things about Christianity through our words and through our relationship and through the things that we do and through the smiles that we show, through nice things that we do for them, through helping them, through talking to them. We need to plant positive things in their minds so that they'll have to fight and argue in their mind. It's all, I heard of negative things about Christianity. But this is the first time that I've seen positive things concerning Christianity. People are not responsive because they heard of negative things concerning Christianity. Obviously, when we look, when we look into this text, Zacchaeus heard of some positive things concerning Christianity. That's why he wanted to see who Jesus was. And we need to be, we don't know who, had, who told Zacchaeus about Christ, but we need to be those people that are planting positive things about Christianity to the minds of this secular world, post-Christianity period. We need to plant in these people's minds that are in this campus positive things concerning Christianity, whether they become Christian or not in this moment or in this week, at this week. Because if they search for something that they are seeking for and they find to find their fulfillment, sometime through the year, uh, they might be going to some kind of things that is not Christian, uh, involved in Christian group or something like that, but sometime in the, in the middle of a semester when they feel empty, Knowing that this is not for me, perhaps because of the positive things that you have said or positive impression that you have left on them, maybe they'll look for a Christian group. Sixth thing about Zacchaeus as we look into this text is that he was desperate. I mean, he was desperate. He had emptiness and he heard of Jesus thinking that maybe this is the answer I'm looking for. This is the person I'm looking for. And he was desperate. Because man of this status was willing to go up on a tree because obviously he was short and he had many crowds, he had obstacles to go to Jesus. So he was desperate enough to go on a tree. A grown man, man of status, man of money. Although there was obstacle, as we look into this text, he went and climbed up the tree. Not only did he climb up the tree, wording in verse 4 of chapter 19 is that he ran ahead. He could have walked, but why would he run? Maybe he was afraid he would miss Jesus. I mean, he was desperate. He ran and climbed the sycamore tree to see him. People in the world are desperate, especially weak like this. People are desperate to seek for something they can, they can be connected to. We need to offer them the right connection, connection in Christ Jesus our Lord. Seventh thing about Zacchaeus as we look into this text is that he was responsive. He was responsive. As you look into other places in the scripture, not everybody's going to be responsive. Some people will be responsive, some people won't be. Even when Jesus spoke, hey, there were some people responsive, there were a lot of people who weren't responsive. So when we go out and speak to people, a lot of people won't, will not be responsive. But perhaps some people will be. When we think about other rich men, rich young men, as we look into other texts of the Bible, he was not responsive. When Jesus said, sell you all your position and come and follow me, young man could not because love for his material was so great at the time. But maybe, although he was not responsive at the time, who knows that later on he was able to throw out his materials and follow Jesus. We need to plant them as much as possible, whether the response is positive or not. Because when they hear about Jesus, one day when they feel empty, maybe they will be seeking for Jesus. That's the kind of people that we're going to go to. What kind of attitude should we have? We'll talk about through Jesus. Let's talk about, secondly, let's talk about Jesus as we look into this text. Something about Jesus uh, through verse 5 that we'll read is this. Jesus knew who 
Zacchaeus was. Jesus knew who he was. First thing that we have to realize about Zacchaeus is that Jesus knew where he was. Jesus knew where he was. Jesus knew where he was. Verse 5, it says, When Jesus reached the spot, he knew where Zacchaeus was. He knew where the sinner was. Now, we need to understand this, that when Jesus was walking and he was passing through Jericho, he could have reached any other spot, but he goes right under the tree and he reached the spot. Not a spot, but he says the spot, meaning there was a specific focus of a place that Jesus wanted to reach. Jesus reached the spot, meaning Jesus knew exactly where Zacchaeus was. As you look into the Bible, Jesus knows where a sinner is. When we think about a Saul, who before he became Paul, he was going to, on the way to Damascus, somehow God, Jesus knew where Saul was and he stops him in the middle of the road and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I am Jesus whom you persecute. He knew where Saul was. There Saul becomes Paul. When we think about 1 Samuel chapter 3, when Samuel was in the temple, Jesus knew, God knew where Samuel was, and he comes and call, uh, calls for Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel says, he may not hear him, hear am I. Exactly God knew where Samuel was. When we think about Adam, Adam sins before God, and he hides behind the rock, of course, God comes to Adam and says, where are you? He's not asking where uh, Adam is, but he's asking, where are you in terms of your relationship with me? Where are you away from me? I love you so much. I'm, I want to provide everything for you. Even if you sin, I can send my son to die for you and save you. But what are you doing? Where are you away from me? He knew where exactly Adam was. And he called for Adam. When we think about Psalm chapter 139, verse 7 through 10, it says this. Where can I go from your spirit? Some writer is saying to God, the Holy Spirit saying, there's no place he can go that where God cannot find him. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depth, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, and if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Meaning, for all the believers as well as non-believers, wherever people are, God knows where we are. Also, God knows where the sinners are. Think of your life. He was always, He always knew where you were. Think about some of the protections and the life-threatening situations and the dangers that you have fa uh, faced. Somehow, He knew you were there. I thank the Lord that He always knew where I was because there were some death threatening situations in my life and somehow miraculously I was saved from that. If God didn't know where I was, I would have been in danger because he couldn't have protected me. But he knew exactly where I was. Point of that is this. We should know where the people are. Okay? We should know where the people are. We should go to them. And we should know where the people are. We, know, we should know where they are. When we think about ourselves worshiping the Lord all the time, fellowshipping, uh, the, fellowshipping with one another, it's nice, but who will lead the spiritual blind if we are gathering to ourselves all the time and don't care who they are in the outside of this wall, church wall? Of course, one of the songs by Amy Grant, her old song, it says, I am not saying that worship is wrong, a song called Mountaintop, talking about all the believers gathering together and worshiping. I am not saying that the worship is wrong, Worship is more than just singing some songs. But if we worship all of the time, there will be no one to lead the blind. We should, go to, we should know where these sinners are, people who do not have a relationship with the Lord, and we should go to them. We should go to them and tell them about Jesus Christ. Second thing about Jesus, as we look into this text, not only Jesus knew where he was, where Zacchaeus was also, but Jesus knew who Zacchaeus was. Not only Jesus knew where Zacchaeus was, but also Jesus knew who Zacchaeus was. Because he comes to the spot in verse 5. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus. He doesn't go, what's your name? He doesn't do that. Who are you? What's your job? How old are you? He doesn't ask that. But he goes, Zacchaeus. He exactly knows who he was. 
He knew his name. Jesus knew Zacchaeus' name. Jesus, of course, knew Zacchaeus' occupation. Jesus, of course, knew Zacchaeus' spiritual state that he is seeking for him. And he knew the motive for climbing the tree. Jesus knew exactly where Zacchaeus was. We need to go to the people and we need to know their names. We need to know what they're doing. We need to know their spiritual state by, through the relationship that we have. And we need to know why people are doing what they're doing. Think about this. Jesus, this, this tax collector, let's say Jesus didn't know Zacchaeus. This old, older man is climbing up a tree who has a status and he's up on a tree. And you can, you can look at him and say, oh, what's this guy doing? What's this guy doing up on a tree? Was, is he, did he escape from mental uh, hospital or something? Said, what's he doing on the tree? You know, a lot of times when we look at non-believers, non-Christians, they are doing a bunch of weird things in their lives. They might be doing drugs. They might be having a promiscuous relationship. They might be going to parties. They might be doing a lot of weird things. But what is important is that we need to know why they are doing what they are doing. Jesus knew when he was climbing up the tree, Jesus knew why he was climbing up the tree. He was empty, he was lonely, he was not satisfied, so he was climbing up the tree to see if Jesus can find him a fulfillment. Jesus exactly knew why Zacchaeus was doing what he was doing. We need to understand by getting to know people, why are they doing the things that they're doing? Probably to find some kind of fulfillment. And we need to look at that and say, ah, you are doing this because of this. And you pray for that. And one day when they're open, one day they will be open. You will be able to tell them, maybe you are doing this because you have that emptiness in your heart. We need to understand this. And Jesus knew where Zacchaeus was. Some, there's some argument between cold evangelism and friendship evangelism, meaning cold evangelism, going to a non-believer and witness. And some people, some Christians say, uh, that's not effective in the post-Christian days. What we need to do is we need to build a relationship and witness to people. Well, when I see in the Bible, we need to do both. We need to go to non-Christians and talk about the gospel, who we meet in the quads and all these things, because a few things about that is that at least we are planting the good positive image uh, concerning Christianity so that maybe in turn they'll become Christian later. Also, there's something called div uh, divine appointment. There's somebody who's just as ready as Zacchaeus. There are. There are testimonials of many people. Okay? It may be rare, but there are people who are out there just ready for you to walk, to his, walk, for you to walk into his life and talk about gospel and they will be responsive. In that case, sure, we need cold evangelism. But also, an uh, uh, effective way in this century is also uh, what we call friendship evangelism, by making them friends and somehow through our life show them that Christ can fulfill their lives. We need both. As, as we look into the scripture, in season, out of season, be ready to preach the gospel. In anybody, any, any relationship that we have, any time that we have, we need to get into that kind of mindset somehow to talk about Christ to anybody that we meet. I say this, when we think about this, Jesus knew who I was when I uh, think about how I became Christian. When I was 12, right after I came from Korea to America when I was 12, he knew who I was. And he knew that was the best time for me to hear the gospel. So he provided a good opportunity in the Bible study so that I can open my heart and accept Christ. He knows who you are and he knows who, who are the people out there. And perhaps there are some people who are ready to hear the gospel now. Maybe this week. One thing I say about hearing the gospel is that any change in person's life gets their hearts ready. Any change in person's life gets their hearts ready. If there's some kind of death in a family, they'll be ready. If there's some kind of major life change like coming to college, they'll be ready. You know, any change in life, people's hearts are ready. A condition, some kind of circumstance or situation they cannot control, they'll be ready because they realize they're humbled through those moments and they're ready to hear what other people who has experienced concerning the, the new experience they're about to go through, they'll be ready to hear from you. Also, another thing about Jesus, not only did he know where he was, not only did he know who he was, but Jesus really wanted, wanted Zacchaeus. Where do we see that? In verse 5. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, 
come down immediately. He tells him to come down immediately, meaning Jesus wants him now. Okay? Jesus wants him now because he wants to give him the fulfillment. He wants to fill, fill his hunger of his heart. He wants to give him himself, the bread of life. He wants to fill that thirst that, is, that he has in his heart by giving him living water in himself, Jesus Christ. Jesus wanted Zacchaeus. Now this is important because when you look at non-Christians that are out there, not only are they smart people, not only are they good-looking people, not only are they good-looking guys and girls, but they are people whom Jesus desperately wants now. Jesus wants them. Think about that. Aren't you glad that Jesus wanted you? The day you accepted Christ as a Savior and Lord, why can't we think that Jesus wants them as well? Not only Jesus wants them, as we look into this text, we will see something more about wanting Zacchaeus. As we look into verse 5, look at this verse very carefully. It says, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And then verse 6, so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. As we read that verse, we miss something. We miss one word that is very, very important. Let's read that one more time. Try to get this. One word that is very important. It says, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house. Emphasis I gave on must. Why do you think Jesus must stay at Zacchaeus' house? Huh? Think about it. Why do you think he said, I must? Is he any less of a God if he doesn't stay at Zacchaeus' house? Will he become so hungry that he needs food at Zacchaeus' house? Because he's so rich, he can have nice food that Jesus wants to stay at Zacchaeus' house. He says, I must. This is one of the few I must that Jesus says. You know why Jesus must stay at Zacchaeus' house? It is because Jesus loves Zacchaeus so much. Not only does he want him, but he needs him. Do you see what I'm saying? Jesus needs his lost sheep because of his love. He loves him so much, Jesus needs Zacchaeus saying, I must stay at your house. He's not any less of a God if Zacchaeus doesn't come into the kingdom of God. That's why we call it grace because it's undeserving favor. If you and I didn't come into the kingdom of God and go to heaven, so what for Jesus? If Jesus did not die on the cross, so what? But Jesus probably said to his father, I must come down and become a man so that I can die for the sinners that are lost. That's why at the end of verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. In conjunction to his love, he needs not only wants, but needs Zacchaeus. There are a lot of lost people out there, and Jesus needs them because Jesus loves them so much. And we need to go. We need to tell them about the Lord. I think when we think about that, Jesus needs two kinds of people, right? Jesus, of course, needs non-believers because he loves them so much. But also Jesus needs believers because we are the only means to reach the non-believers who are dying without Christ. Only reason why we exist in this world is so that we can represent Christ in this world and tell them about the living water, bread of life in Jesus Christ. We need to understand that. If you love somebody, you'll do anything for him. If we love Jesus, we'll do anything for them. If we truly love people that are dying out there, we'll do anything for them. And remember, in John chapter 20, he says to Peter, if you love me, John, uh, Simon, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, then feed my sheep. If we love Jesus, we need to go to people, uh, tell them about Christ and feed them the bread of life. I think about a story of a, of a knight who was so loyal to the king. And when king wants a water from the spring of this mountain, in order for this knight to go to the spring, he has to go across the enemy territory. And he puts his life on the line and go get that one cup of water because he's so loyal to the king. And he brings back all bloody, almost dying, and brings back the spring and he dies for the king. 
And King sees that. And he's moved and touched by the loyalty of his servant knight. I think we need to have at least that much loyalty for a God who died in behalf of us. We need to, if we truly love our God, we will not only want these lost people, want these lost people who are out there, just like we'll have the heart of our God, we will need them in our hearts and we will go to them and tell them about Christ. Just like, in one sense, they, these people are like the spring of water in the mountains. And we need to go to them, putting our lives on the line and get them and bring them, bring the spring water and people to our Lord and King, Jesus Christ. As I was going to Houston this weekend, this weekend, as I was going to Houston, from the Champagne to Chicago, I, I got into this American Eagle, this small airplane. And uh, in the middle of a airplane ride, there was some air, uh, you know, storm or something like that, and it was shaking badly. I mean, I'm sick of riding airplane, and I, I've been on airplane ride so much. <laughs> As, as you know, and uh, but this is the worst air wave I have ever experienced in my life. Even I was scared. I mean, it moved so much. I mean, suddenly, boom, it moved so much. I was so scared. I literally thought I was going to die. I was praying for my family. I was praying for you guys and saying, Lord, if I die, this pulpit is going to be empty. And at home, they're going to uh, the fa father's going to miss be missing and husband's going to be missing. I'm not going to be there. I was so scared I was playing like that. I was looking at two people that are sitting in front of me and they were hugging each other and crying because it was so scared. All the drinks were spilled and, and the middle thing that they carry on the food and drink was shake so much. It jumped up like this and boom, came down. It was that scary. I was looking at these two ladies in front of me. I really wanted to get up and preach. <laughs> if I did, I think it was very effective at the time. <laughs> Good place to uh, witness is airplane and sauna. You know, when you go to sauna, it's hot. You know how hot hell would be and things like that. <laughs> or hot weather or something like that. But point is this. I was looking at those two people in front of me as they were crying. I was thinking, man, I mean, I'm a Christian. And I'm scared for death. I think about them. When they don't know where they're going for eternity, wouldn't you be scared? I don't know how in the world people can live without Christ. Let's go this week. Get to know them. Let's go to where the people are. Let's get to know them. And let's want them and need them. Hey, tell them about Christ. I suggest this as, we, as you go out on a new student outreach week. Different from last year, maybe focus on quality rather than quantity. Okay, pray a lot so that some people who will be responsive to gospel or relationship, focus on quality of relationship rather than trying to finish everything, you know, going by, try to focus on quality rather than quantity. I was so convicted as I was thinking about it all throughout airplane, and this morning I was just thinking about New Student Outreach Week, and this couple weeks I've been filled with that in my mind, and my mind's about to burst. And that's a conviction I received, focused on quality. If somebody's open, talk to them. Maybe not two hours, you know, but long enough time that you can build some relationship and have continued relationship. Focus on quality and quantity. Because there are people out there who are scared. Hey, let's pray. Can we pray for a few minutes? Let's pray for one another and let's pray for this campus. Let's pray for the people that are out there. Think about it, guys. How can people live in the world without Christ? <laughs> How?
Can you imagine your life without Christ? Somebody asked me this week, what, what do you think you would have been if you didn't become a minister? It was unimaginable for me to think about that. I'm so happy that He uses me. I'm so happy that I'm saved for eternity. Put yourself in their shoes and let's pray for them, shall we? Let's pray for all the Christian organizations in this campus that they'll be trying to reach out to people. Let's pray that somehow these people, not only for our church, but for all the Christian organizations, let's pray that the Spirit of God will cover this campus. And just imagine Holy Spirit with wings is covering this campus. I always pray like that. I imagine the Holy Spirit just covering this campus. Somehow there's a spiritual battle going on this, this weekend. This week there's going to be a spiritual battle going on. Let's pray that Though will use his people and his people would rise to the occasion and fight this battle on their knees and talk to them about Jesus. Hey, okay? let's pray for this campus, shall we? Lord, we thank you so much that you have given us your son, Jesus, who's the reason why we live, who's the object of our faith, who's the object of our radical walk, going toward Jesus in our life, in this pilgrim's journey, that we are going toward Jesus, becoming more like Jesus, following him. Thank you for the reason to live in Christ. We pray that there are many people who are empty out there will be more empty this week so that as Christians all over the campus will go to them. May they be responsive to the true reason to live and to the true worthy object of their faith as well. We pray that you will open the hearts of people in this campus this week and Christians will rise to the occasion and show them the love of Jesus Christ and become arms and feet of Christ going to them and give them the loving shoulder and loving advices so that many people who are lost out there will find Christ. We pray the Spirit of God will work this week. Be with us. Be with all the Christians in the campus and all the organizations. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Shall we all rise and sing about that we are not lost in sin but we are lost in love. Okay? Let's sing about that. Manifest your love in me By your presence let me see Fatherless I'll never be When I am with you Bring the love that casts our fears Melodies I long to hear Only you can dry my tears When I am with you Oh Lord, when I am with you I can't deny your love and my heart. 
heart is laid open before you when I am with you I'm lost in love I am lost within your love when your voice comes like a dove I can feel your gentle touch when I am with you. When I am with you, I know you will stay and never go. Oh, your love you freely show when I am with you. When I am with you, it's easy. I can't deny your love and my heart is laid open before you. When I am with you, I'm lost in love. Sing that one more time. Manifest your love in me. Manifest your love in me. By your presence, let me see, fatherless I'll never be, when I am with you. Bring the love that cast out fear, melodies I long to hear. Can dry my tears when I am with you. Oh Lord, when I'm with you. Oh Lord, when I am with you, it's easy. I can't deny your love, and my heart is laid open. I am lost within your love. I am lost within your love. When your voice comes like a dove, I can feel your gentle touch when I am with you. When I am with you, I know. You will stay and never go. All your love you freely show when I am with you. Oh Lord, when I'm with you. Oh Lord, when I am with you, it's easy. I can't deny your love and my heart is laid open. I'm lost in love. Oh Lord, when I'm with you. Oh Lord, when I am with you, it's easy. I can't deny your love, and my heart is laid open before you. When I am with you, I'm lost in love. Oh Lord, when I'm with you. When I am with you, it's easy. I can't deny your love, and my heart is laid open before you. When I am with you, I'm lost in love. Oh Lord, when I'm with you, one more time. Oh Lord, when I am with you, it's easy. I can't deny your love, and my heart is laid open before you. When I am with you, I'm lost in love. Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you and praise you that you have saved us from the lostness of our sin. As we hold on to the rock in the storm of life, may we reach out with the other hands to all those people who are lost in sin so that they may, as well as us, will be lost in love. We pray that you will manifest your love within us this week as well as the year to come so that many people who are lost in sin can be lost in love as well. As we decide it within our hearts, may the grace of our Lord Jesus and amazing and awesome love of our God and never-ending fellowship, counseling, helping of the Holy Spirit may be with you all from now and forevermore. Amen. One last announcement is uh, as you leave uh, to the table in the back, there are these little slips of paper. And um, if you're going to be a student here at U of I, or if you're going to be uh, a Parkland or whatever, and you're going to be attending uh, the church, please fill out your name and address and phone number and some different things, because we want to make a directory, and uh, we want to get a quick start as soon as possible. And uh, let's continue our worship and fellowship now, and please join us for refreshments and fellowship downstairs. Uh -huh.